Hi, Dr. Mamari again, and I'm going to perform experiment three. Experiment three of the um, laboratory manual that is designed and published only for Central Campus. Um, you will buy the ebook from Vital Source for for um, remote learning lab and uh, the experiment three. The, the purpose for this video is to provide you data for your experiment so you could turn in the data sheet, pre-lab questions. It would be another assignment that you are going to either take as a quiz or turn in the assignment um, to the assignment folder um, by studying the chapter itself, the experiment three part theory and explanation that comes with the, with the experiment. Uh, we are going to perform experiment regarding empirical formula. What is empirical formula? Empirical formula is the um, lowest whole number ratio of the elements in compound. And uh, so when you read this theory, you learn about the empirical formula. How would you calculate the empirical formula? You need to have the mass for each of the elements in the compound. When you have the mass for each element in the compound, then use the periodic table to find the atomic mass to convert the mass for each element to number of moles for each element. When you have the moles for each element, then you have mole ratio. To find the lowest ratio, you divide both numbers or all numbers. If you have more than uh, two elements, you divide by the lowest number of moles. I understand that by explaining this way, it might be a little too fast for you, but when you study this experiment, the theory of the experiment, you will get it and also listen um, to the video. So you find the um, number of moles for each element, you divide all of them by the lowest mole number, that gives you the lowest ratio. Lowest ratio is not sufficient for empirical formula. You have to have the whole number uh, lowest ratio. So in order to get the whole number for lowest ratio, you sometimes you have to multiply uh, by a fixed number. Let's say if you get a 0.5 for one of your number of moles, you multiply everything by two, then that 0.5 would change to two because fraction or decimal is not allowed in the empirical formula. It has to be whole number. Uh, but lowest uh, ratio. So you will have to get the uh, calculation following the uh, the instruction that is showing in the in the calculation part. We have the definitions for empirical formula, the purpose we are doing this experiment. All of that is is uh, explained. So you could find the mass ratio for practical purposes. You will find the mole ratio. We find by performing this experiment, we are going to find the uh, empirical formula, and we also are going to to study the uh, kind of law for conservation of the mass to see what how much of the mass of the product we get at the end of the zinc iodide. Then the the compound that we are going to study is zinc iodide. So I am going to um, actually start the procedure for the experiment and for you to collect your data. Make sure to study the first three pages in order to be able to answer the pre-lab questions and uh, perform the experiment uh, or watch the experiment to collect your data and then you will um, turn in your uh, pre-lab and your data sheet after you complete using the instructions and the, the uh, data collected for today's lab as a result of today's lab. Okay, I'm going to start with the procedure for the um, experiment. Procedure for this experiment, experiment three. First, uh, we are going to start with measuring the mass of, and you can just follow the procedure step by step and step, because you are going to have access to this procedure uh, when you purchase your lab manual online the ebook for the lab manual. So we are going to um, first heat up the evaporating dish. 
we are uh, using a Bunsen burner, we are going to heat up the evaporating dish to get a fixed mass because if there is any extra volatile compound or moisture on the evaporating dish, it's not going to be the same as if it was completely clean and dry. So in order to uh, remove anything excess from the evaporating dish, we are going to fire the, the uh, evaporating dish on, on Bunsen burner. So I'm going to turn on the Bunsen burner first. To turn on the Bunsen burner, you have three separate valves that you have to adjust it. One is the main gas valve adjuster here that you can open. It depends on how high you want the, the high cover. There's a gas adjustment for this knob on the, on the um, right side. You have the gas adjustment, and you're going to just righty tighty and then left the uh, loosey. So you would you are going to rotate to the left side to open it and right side to, to close it. And so you are going to open the gas valve. And also air valve adjustment. So by moving the cylinder, right, if you have to hold on to the cylinder in order to uh, to again right the tidy left the loosey to the left side, and you are going to see this opening here, it gets increased, more air is going to uh, come through. What is the benefit of adjusting this? Then you are going to, you know, to get proper ratio of gas um, oxygen, so the natural gas, which is the organic compound, and then the oxygen. The oxygen is provided from the air. The gas is coming from the gas valve here. So if the ratio is not proper, what's going to happen? If the, the I'm going to show you what's going to happen so you can see it better. Um, if I turn on the gas, uh, if I turn on the Bunsen burner, um, I should have stopped, make sure everything is working before I um, keep striking. It's like two times, three times strike, it, it doesn't turn on. You have to make sure your adjustment, um, make sure the gas is open, the gas is open, the air, some air is allowed. The striker is working. When you uh, try the striker, you should see a spark here. Sometimes by moving it up and sliding, you don't create any spark, so it's not working. So striker could be working, and you don't know how to work with the striker. So basically, you have to press it down, this movable piece, press it down and slide, so you could create the, the spark. That could be one problem that you cannot turn on the buzzer burner because if you're not engaging, there is no spark being created here. When the Bunsen burner turns on, what type of flame we like to have is the blue color, the two or three cone. We don't want this yellow color. Yellow color means incomplete combustion. And when you have incomplete combustion, that means the air is not enough. If you don't have enough air, the result of the, the chemical reaction of a combustion reaction of the gas the product gives products of carbon dioxide and water, uh, but if you don't provide enough oxygen, it's giving up carbon monoxide. The yellow color and some smoke that is coming to the edge, that's actually producing carbon monoxide. Two problem, carbon monoxide is toxic. You don't want to have it in the lab and inhale it. Second problem is that the flame is not hot enough. So how to take care of that problem? You have to provide more oxygen. To provide more oxygen, you're going to rotate the, the cylinder to the left side until you get enough gas. You see the two cones here on the, uh, on the flame? You have the darker and lighter blue color of the cones. Now you have perfect uh, flame. So you are going to hold, use a crucible tongue, hold your evaporating dish over the, over the flame, um, try to, to heat it up to evaporate any water that is in there, is in the uh, evaporating dish. They are, this container dried, we haven't used them for a long time. I just want to make sure to show you the technique and how to, how to use this. So when it's done, uh, when I heat it long enough that uh, the water evaporated, now I have to place it on the surface in order to get the get the uh, evaporating dish cooled down to room temperature. 
So I'm going to leave it on this space that is clean. I can use a wire gun also to hook and to place it on a wire gun. So I can leave this on a wire gun to allow it to cool down before I can measure the mass. Okay. So I'm going to let it cool down. Uh, before I measure the mass, I don't need the flame for a while, so I'm going to turn off the um, turn off the Bunsen burner. When we need it, I come back and turn it on again. Okay. I need about 25 grams of zinc. While it's cooling off, I'm measuring the 0.5 grams, and I will be using it soon. Now, so 0.5 grams of the zinc. As you saw for experiment one, I'm going to measure this uh, indirectly. If we have a chemical that we want to measure the mass. So I place the uh, main paper, just explaining you one more time how we did that for experiment one. Uh, main paper, press the tear button to tear to get the mass of the main paper zero. Then I can add the uh, 0.5 grams. The mass is um, 0.500. Um, it does fluctuate, but the most stable number is a 0.500. Um, it goes from 0.499 to 0.500. And since the report, the, the data sheet asks for the mass of the crucible and then mass of the crucible with the um, evaporating dish and this and the zinc we are going to uh, we are going to follow that format so we don't have to figure out those numbers and change them so mass of the empty evaporating dish before i place that i'm just going to make sure it's zero again Place the evaporating dish, record the mass. The mass for evaporating dish is 40.259, 40.259, and that is for A. I'm going to add 0.5 grams of zinc. B is 40.759 grams. Then we have mass of the uh, Iodine, stoppered iodine, mass of the stoppered iodine. So I'm going to take this out. We have those. Going to, because it's a test tube, I'm going to place the test tube on the uh, 
inside a picture to measure the map, so I don't have to lay it down, even though it's stuffed already, but still, it's the, the correct way. If you have a test tube, it's better to have a container to place the test tube in, but you don't need the mass of the beaker, so you just leave the test tube inside a beaker. So we have 12.172. Point seven two, and that is C. Okay, so twelve point one seven two gram. That is the mass for Stafford test. Then we're gonna follow the procedure. Uh, we have the masses already recorded. We are going to take the um, take it to the film hood. We are going to take the evaporating dish to film hood. We add water and the acidic acid. I'm going to take the computer so you can see what I'm doing inside the film hood. We place the evaporating dish inside the film hood. We add five milliliters of uh, deionized water. Three drops of six molar acetic acid following the procedure. And I add the iodine to the evaporating dish. So I have the evaporating dish with the zinc and iodine is reacting. See that iodine has dissolved and slowly is going to react with the with the zinc and produces zinc iodide. How do I know the reaction is complete or I can stop? I have to make sure that iodine, the way the experiment was designed, iodine is the limiting reactant, zinc is the excess compound. So we should have excess amount of the zinc left over and all of the iodine needs to be consumed. One evidence for iodine to be consumed entirely is if the yellow color goes away and it changes to clear color. So until the yellow color is in, we are not sure that the, there is still some leftover of, of the iodine. So it's going to get more brown before it gets, it gets colorless uh, because the iodine that is here now is reacting. So it's, uh, it's dark color. I'm going to leave it in the fume hood and I have to mix it. I have to make sure that the, uh, the reaction is complete by and enhanced by mixing it to make it faster. And sometimes it's just the uh, the matter of time, how long it takes for this reaction to take place. The reaction must be done in the film hood because iodine is toxic and we cannot have outside of the film hood. So sometimes it takes 15 minutes just mixing it. Sometimes it takes less. It depends on how much extra of the iodine, how much of the iodine we have. I'm going to leave this in the fume hood, uh, 
and you can go ahead and measure mass of the empty test tube. That is the mass of empty stopper test tube. Because it takes time, you can use the time efficiently and finish some of the other work while we are waiting. So that's the empty test tube. I placed the empty test tube on the balance. On the scale, 11.727. And that goes for D. Okay, so we have the mass of the iodine to begin to stop for starting the reaction. We have the mass of the zinc that we started the reaction with. And we add the water, we add the, so the acidic acid, the reaction is going on. It might take 10 to 15 minutes. The uh, dark color it has to disappear and it should go to a uh, colorless solution. If it's colorless, completely colorless, that is the ideal. Uh, that is ideal. Okay. Uh, for the step 12 of this experiment is asking me to decant it into another um, another to a beaker, I have extra evaporating dish, and I'm going to directly because then it needs to be transferred to the evaporating dish. So I'm just going to um, to get the mass of the evaporating dish and uh, file the evaporate the second evaporating dish. So when I'm decanting, I can decant directly into evaporating dish. If the number, if the supply is limited and we don't have enough evaporating dish. To give two per group, then we decant into a uh, beaker, and then we will transfer later on to the evaporating dish after the first part of the part one of the experiment is done. But sometimes, uh, if we have enough supply and we leave ahead and we are prepared to do the experiment, then we can combine two steps. We can actually be more more efficient. So I'm going to fire the second um, evaporating dish. While we are waiting for yellow color to disappear or for iodine to react with the zinc completely, so I can actually use the time and prepare equipment and chemicals for part two of the experiment. I hope you understand the firing part, the firing of evaporating dish, just to, just to remove anything that is volatile, anything that is going to affect the mass uh, later, because if we don't do that, and you see this brown spots here, if the mass is not stable, if let's say you have a paper there, you measure the mass later on after you heat up this for a long time, is going to, um, is going to burn the paper and the mass gets that lower and it's going to cause error, uh, experimental error. Okay, it's um, heated, we wait for it to um, cool down to room temperature, cool down to room, te room temperature before I can measure the mass for second evaporating dish and that goes actually for part two. Of the experiment.
it's too hot. Even if I get this close to the, evap or the evaporating dish, I can feel the radiation of the heat. So it's too hot. We have to wait until it's cooled down to room temperature before uh, we can measure the mass. So while we are waiting for evaporating dish to cool down, we can come back here and make sure that We mix the zinc with iodine, trying to get it, trying to get it to react faster. So it's very dark color now, and this dark color should disappear. It should get very light for us to make sure that the reaction is complete. For constant mixing, it's going to help the reaction to be um, to take place faster. But um, the time is a little bit more. Uh, time is more significant, so we have to allow time for the reaction. So mixing is a factor, but time is the primary factor for the reaction to take place. So, the evaporating dish that we have here is, is cooled down to room temperature. I can bring to my hands right very close to it and it's not, I don't want to touch it because I don't want to leave any residue of oil on it from my hand. So we can make this zero and the balance has to be here, make it zero. And after it's zero, I place the evaporating dish record the mass. This is for part 2a. So this is the mass for evaporating dish for part two of the of the experiment. Okay.
Okay, so we have the mass for we have the mass for the evaporating dish for part two of the experiment. But it's time now, time for checking on the zinc iodide reaction. Hopefully, is somewhat done or at least lighter color. I'm taking you back and forth because I'm working just by myself. Usually, when you are in the lab, you work in group of two and uh, you can share the work but for me to do the experiment by myself and i want to make sure that you actually get to see every step so you're not just working the data you're actually watching the experiment just like if your lab partner was doing this part of the experiment and you were recording data and doing other parts of the experiment so you get better experience with the remote lab too dark too dark the reaction is not complete you can see that and uh, I'm going to give more time for this reaction to take place it's better always to read the experiment completely understand the procedure before you come to the lab so you can actually use the time more efficiently and you would go prepare equipment and chemicals for the next steps. So I have all the iodine dissolved, but not reacted yet, is reacting. I'm gonna leave it here, go and do another part of the experiment because it takes more time for this reaction to be complete. So. What can we do for the rest of the, uh, the experiment? We can um, actually prepare the equipment because the chemicals are engaged. The chemicals are in the other. Uh, so, we need to find some. At one point of this experiment, I have to use gravity filtration. So I'm going to prepare gravity filtration apparatus um, for this experiment. And for the gravity filtration, We need a um, glass funnel. Um, when you have a mixture of solid and when do you use the filtration? Uh, filtration is used when you have a mixture of solid and liquid. There are two ways to separate the mixture of solid and liquid. One would be uh, one would be decanting, and the second part is filtration. So you could do decanting and filtration. With the mixture of the uh, solids and liquid that we have for this experiment, I think the procedure calls for decanting. You could replace it with the, with the filtration, or if the procedure is asking to, to dry it in the zinc in the evaporating dish, then we have to uh, decant it. So I'm showing you how to prepare the uh, gravity filtration um, apparatus because we use it for another part of the experiment that 
I missed it for experiment two anyway. So let's me that is the graphic filtration. Just leave it there in case we need to use it. So I'm using the time to prepare for next steps. And also I need to evaporate the liquid. When we get the solution, the solution contains zinc iodide. The solution contains zinc iodide and the solid that is left in the evaporating dish is going to be excess of zinc. The solution portion needs to be evaporated. Uh, the solvent evaporates, so what is left would be powder, like a white powder of zinc iodide. That is the product that we are going to recover for part two of the experiment. And the zinc that is left over, we are going to dry it using heating lamp and measure the mass again in order to find how much of zinc was left as unreacted uh, zinc. So I have my uh, Bunsen burner set up. To set up the Bunsen burner, I use an iron ring here to support the wire gauze because later on I'm going to place my evaporating dish on the wire gauze. So there's something to support it because I cannot depend on this. It's more safer if I'm using a wire gauze or sometimes we could use like clay, uh, a triangle. Uh, with another equipment that we could use, but wire gauze is more secure. It's important for us to know the height of the the height of the flame and the height or the level of the iron ring. If I leave the iron ring all the way up here and the flame is all the way down, it's going to take much longer time for liquid to evaporate for the solvent to evaporate so i try to adjust the height of the flame as like a two inches um, the iron ring it should be about two inches higher than it should be about two inches higher than the base of the flame or tip of the bunsen burner of cylinder so that's how the the Bunsen and burner is set up when you are using the wire gauze. Sometimes you make like hot water bath, like we did for experiment uh, one for boiling point. Sometimes you have to heat up any container um, supporting the wire gauze. So you know how to set up Bunsen and burner for heating up. The other equipment that we are going to use today is the heating lamp. The heating lamp is just the heating lamp. It generates lots of heat that you can dry the, um, and evaporate the, the water or moisture from our product. So I have the heating lamp also ready to go here. When we have the, uh, when we get the zinc separated from the solution by decanting or filtration, we are going to place it underneath the place it underneath the heating lamp and uh, evaporate it to clean this so it doesn't get um, stuck to the bottom of the evaporating dish before I use it. So my equipments are ready for the next step, but I need to check and make sure the chemical reaction is taking place. This is a long, long. Um, reaction. It takes very long time. It's a slow reaction um, because it's just the aqueous solution. And but the good thing is that it works, and it has worked in the past. If we put excess amount of the zinc, it will react with all of the iodine, and the reaction will be complete. With the evidence that the color of iodine disappears, that means all iodine has been
Okay, I don't know if we can recognize using the color. Now, it is lighter brown, but still it's too dark for us to stop the reaction. Just taking break. Just taking break of that. And look into into the procedure. It's going to be a while because it's still too dark. I'm gonna give some time and go back and mix it again. <clears throat> So based on the procedure today, we are going to decant in order to separate the zinc from um, the solution. So we are not going to use the gravity filtration for this experiment, but I'm going to use it for something else that part of experiment two. And at least I hope that is happening is much lighter yellow color, lighter brown color.
I'm using Blackboard uh, Collaborate for recording. There is no uh, option for pause. And that's why you have to just wait here. Um, if there was a, a option, there was an option for pause, I would have put the recording on pause and then start recording. But if I stop recording and start recording, then it's going to be like two or three more videos. So I cannot uh, pause that. So I just want to have one video for it. It's going to be longer video. Because uh, we have to wait, but that's the reality. This part of this experiment is designed for like two labs or two hours. And the challenging part of it is to get these reactions to be complete. But much lighter color, much lighter color of the iodide. Almost done. But um, you could see that there's some leftover of the zinc. So we are going to have leftover of the zinc for sure in this reaction. And all of the iodine needs to be consumed for complete reaction. And if you don't let it, if we don't, um, be patient, and we don't get the uh, we don't get the iodine to be consumed in the reaction. Later on, it's going to cause error for your calculation. So the mass of the iodide that you use actually because you are going to get the mass of the iodide using the balance, not the reaction initial mass that whatever iodine you, you use is expected to be dissolved and it's expected to be reacting. Um, and if you take it while it stays yellow and decant it, some unreacted iodine will go into the uh, um, decanted solution, um, the clear solution, and the mass that you are going to get is not the mass of zinc iodide. It would be the mass of zinc iodide plus unreacted iodine, which is not going to give you correct number. And we're wondering why the numbers don't work. How come you are not getting straightforward numbers like they give you in lecture and uh, all of that. And that goes back to who actually did the experiment. If you were patient, you actually waited for the yellow color to disappear, or you just, you know, rushed through the experiment. You see the color is disappearing, and I was, you know, hoping that this would happen. So it means the reaction is working. This is working. Okay. Okay. I'm going to. I collected some drops of the solution here uh, by placing my steering rod in there. So I'm going to have to transfer because otherwise I will be using the product. Having some here water and transfer.
time. The brown color is gone and we have a light yellow color here. Okay. Very light yellow color. Okay, for second part of the experiment, or to separate the zinc from um, to separate the zinc from the uh, the excess zinc or unreacted zinc from zinc iodide, going to decant the solution portion of it into second evaporating dish. We have the mass of this already recorded for you, so. I'm going to decant this into decanting, meaning just pouring off the liquid or the uh, pouring off the liquid. When you have a mixture of solid and and liquid decanting, meaning you pour off the liquid without getting any solid, okay, without getting any solid into the the sleeving container, which in this case is my second evaporating dish. I'm adding more water uh, and washing it. Just want to make sure that there is no leftover of the salt with the zinc. Okay. I make sure all the, um, the liquid is transferred without getting any any solid and I wash the and I wash the zinc with the eye water. Okay. When you get to read this experiment before you actually watch the video, you know the next step is for me to get the zinc or excess of zinc dried. So when it's dry, I can measure the I can measure the mass. To dry the zinc, we are using heating lamp. So I'm placing my evaporating dish under the heating lamp here. I'm going to turn on the heating lamp and place the evaporating dish under the heating lamp. Until Dry. When it's dry, when I try to move the zinc, it's going to the zinc particle is going to move around. When it's wet, the zinc particles are kind of clumped together and they are not moving around. That is the last step for part one of the experiment because we want to get the mass of the unreacted zinc. So we are waiting for that. And while we're waiting for that one, I'm going to go ahead and start part two of the experiment. In part two of the experiment, we need the mass of empty evaporating dish, which I have it as a part 2A, 45.981. That's the mass of empty evaporating dish. We get the solution into the evaporating dish. And with the solution that we have in the evaporating dish, it needs to be vaporized. The solvent needs to be vaporized. So this solution is solution of zinc iodide. When we evaporate the water part, the solvent, we are going to end up with the powder or solid zinc iodide. The heating must be gentle. We don't want to get we don't want to get any of the the water uh, the solution 
which contains the salt to spatter out of the evaporating dish. So I monitor the boiling. When I monitor the boiling part of this, is going to uh, show me, you know, if, if it's like gentle boiling, I'm fine with it. If it's not gentle boiling, if it's like boiling very uh, harsh and big bubbles, the chance for uh, spattering of the of the solution out of the container, I'm going to remove the flame and remove it and move it back and forth in order to give like gentle uh, boiling. So I do need gentle boiling for this evaporation because I don't want to lose any of the product. So going to wait for now and make sure that uh, it starts boiling. And when it is boiling, it has to be gentle boiling. Okay, so we have two procedures taking place, uh, two uh, steps of the procedure taking place at once. The uh, drying of the zinc, unreacted zinc, so we want to know how much of the zinc was reacted. We have initial mass mass for initial uh, initial mass for the zinc, whatever we start with, 0.5 grams. And if we get the mass of unreacted, we subtract from initial mass, and this way we can get the mass of reacted. We also have the mass for reacted iodine because we have the mass before and after uh, for the uh, for the test tube. When we had the iodine and we had uh, empty mass for empty test tube. Okay. So if you have the mass of the element, we can calculate the empirical formula using periodic table, changing the mass of each element to uh, moles, and then dividing by a smaller number to get the uh, molar, a small, a lowest ratio. And if it's not whole number, we have to treat in order to get whole number. So if you get like a 0.5, you divide by, you multiply by two um, to get a whole number. If you get 0.33 for one of them, you divide, you multiply by uh, three to get the whole number. So you have to treat number. Uh, by the time you you do this experiment, or you have to write a report or data sheet. For this experiment lecture portion of the class uh, you will learn about the lecture your lab professor um, if it's me or anybody else is going to also uh, have a meeting with you a short meeting with you to explain about the theory of the um, theory of the experiment so hopefully and you read the experiment the theory of the experiment from the lab manual carefully in order to understand how to do the calculus Have student office going to let her know. Let's see if the zinc, the unreacted zinc, has been dried. 
and if it's been dried, the big particles are moving around, but not all of it. So, stay until you have something longer. Make sure that it's completely dry. Maybe just two more minutes. I don't want to lose any zinc particle because I touched the zinc with the, the stirring rod. I have to get the pieces, make sure the pieces are back into the center of the zinc after the zinc. Because the error for mass here and there can add up. And when it does add up, your numbers are not going to look nice. Well, the numbers are not going to be perfect numbers because these are not made up numbers. These are the real numbers that is called actual. You have actual numbers and then you have theoretical values. The difference between actual and theoretical values in experiment is called experimental error or percent error. Some range of percent error is acceptable in a in a experiment so that percentage of error it the acceptable range it depends on the experiment what type of experiment we are doing what's the the, the rate or the if the for example chemical reaction reaches equilibrium it doesn't reach equilibrium and it also depends on the error caused by human error uh, caused by the person who is performing the, the experiment. So we don't expect 100% always percent yield or 0% error, but there's some sort of a, uh, a uh, acceptable range. And for that acceptable range, it's going to be different from one experiment to another experiment. I'm not going to give a number to you um, because then it can cause... Uh, you know, expectation for students, um, but it depends on your professor who is teaching what is the number that they are going to expect. And but it's not 100%. Always. Okay. The uh, zinc. Uh, perfect. Unreacted zinc is. I'm going to show it to you. Actually, what I mean by you see the zinc is moving around and if it's moving around that means it's not moist because it, when it was moist it was staying it was stuck to the wall uh, because it was moist now it's moving around and it shows that it is dry so i'm going to turn off the uh, heating lamp at this point wait for the uh, for evaporating it to cool down to room temperature and uh, weigh the container, which is the evaporating plus unreacted thing. Also, I want to show you what I mean by the gentle boiling. If you can see the boiling there, is the gentle boiling. is not crazy, it's not spagging, and it's not moving the chemicals out. can measure the mass of the zinc. The balance needs to be paired. The unreacted zinc. This is for part one of the experiment. And it's going to be it's going to go to part E for part one. So if I don't say it's part two, it's part of the part one. But since I already brought part one into the data part, I'm going to specify part one. Okay. Part one, letter E. And the mass is 40.642. 40.642. 
forty point six four two gram. This is the mass of. You can use this to find the mass of unreacted zinc. Perfect. One last part to the experiment is we have to wait for this solution to dry out completely before we can measure the mass. There are some questions, like additional questions. Uh, you can answer those questions. Basically, it's like calculation with hypothetical numbers. Um, or you could also ask the professor who is uh, teaching the lab, uh, you know, to if you need any clarification. I cannot give you the answer at this point, because if I give you the answer, then uh, there's really nothing for you to do because I did the experiment. Um, so the experiment, the, these questions are straightforward. They are not very complicated. Um, so it's going to tell you what to uh, what to do um, for to answer those questions. Like a, writing a balanced equation, like if you have zinc plus I two. Uh, what would be the product? But the part of the experiment, which I can I understand, as a remote learner, you are not going to be able to come to the lab to perform the experiment to collect the data. I do that part of the experiment for you to give you the data so you don't have to be here for this time. to start. Half of the experiment. This one part of the experiment, I missed it for experiment two. When I was recording experiment two, I'm going to have to perform that experiment today.
The hottest part of the flame, since we have time, I'll show you some more techniques. The hottest part of the flame is the top of the inner cone right here. Top of the inner cone, that's the hottest part of the flame. If you go down or you go up, it's not going to, the, the temperature actually uh, drops. The hottest part is the top of the inner cone. So if you adjust the container or where you're heating up the level that it touches, uh, that it touches the top of the inner cone, you are providing the highest temperature of the flame. And if you want like cool flame, you have to make it more distant. Definitely no yellow color flame because low, yellow color flame has low temperature, but is not a safe flame to work with. Just kind of give time. And at this point, if I have low flame, is better. And it's going to give maybe two, three minutes time. It will finish. Just going to give time for it. Okay, so you probably want to know what's going on. Almost there. And it just needs maybe like a couple more minutes to dry up completely. When it gets low, uh, drying out, it's, it happens like quickly because that's very concentrated at this point. Because you have all of your uh, zinc iodide in that small volume of solvent so it's very concentrated is a thick solution at this point
Not two minutes, right? The estimated is just such a small volume. It could be the, the problem could be the concentration is very high. Almost there, almost. For yourself. Almost there. The water is gone, it's dry. If I continue heating, I'm going to lose the powder. So I'm going to stop and lift it up for like much more gentle heating. You don't want the color to change. Color should stay white color as it is. But you want to make sure all the water has been evaporated. Okay. Done. Turn off the Bunsen burner. We leave the why the evaporating dish. To cool down the room temperature before we measure the mass. When you are measuring the mass, you should always measure the mass at room temperature. So to be consistent. Uh, we have to measure the mass at room temperature. So I'm leaving on the on the wire gauze wait until it cools down to room temperature. The same thing again. I'm going to close my hand. If I don't feel the radiation of the heat, it's good enough for me to uh, to measure. But I still feel it. it would be a while because it's dry. There is no liquid. Um, if we had if we had like a hot water because of the specific heat that water has it takes longer for it to lose the heat but for solid clay like this with the um, it doesn't have a much uh, it doesn't have a high a specific heat as a result it can actually uh, change the temperature the temperature of the object itself is going to go up and down quickly so it can reach the room temperature quick 
it doesn't take that long. I guess you learn about that end of general chemistry or beginning of general chemistry too. Okay, we measure the mass of evaporating dish with the zinc iodide, and that goes into part two. That goes into part two plus dry B, which is the dry. Uh, product. So part two B. And the mass is forty six point five zero eight. Forty six point five zero. Is changing so eight, uh, and that is gram. That's for part B. For part C, is asking for color of the zinc iodide powder, which is a white powder, white solid or white powder, and that should go to part C of the data sheet. Everything else, you do have like mass of the zinc iodide, um, which you actually need to do the calculation based on the information that you have. But the information to be collected in the lab are those numbers that I already um, typed in the chat area. Also, I said it, so you can record those numbers. And also, the uh, description of the, the appearance, just because it's a white powder, I showed you so you can record your uh, observation based on the observation or it's white powder. That's what you have. Okay, we are done with part of experiment three. I'm going to stop the recording here. <coughs> Again, you might, if you have any questions, I'm sure your professor is going to, um, if it's me or anybody else, is going to explain um, using the classroom chat or blackboard thank you